Yeah, hi. Um, my name's Andy Hess, as you heard. Uh, with me is Louis Cataldi, who is, uh, we were both evangelists with Epic Games. Uh, our job is to basically go around the world and engage uh, new developers and educators and get them excited about Unreal Engine and uh, kind of explain a little bit about, you know, why it's good and why you should be excited about it and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, help you guys make amazing gaming experiences and simulation experiences. Uh, I'm not going to spend very much time pitching the engine. We're here really to talk about our learnings in VR. Uh, Epic is very close partners with Oculus and Vive and Google, all of the leaders in the VR space. We get the latest and greatest hardware. We influence their technology decisions and vice versa. Um, and we have a large design team. You know, we make we make games, and uh, we have a large design team that is tackling the challenge of design in VR. And uh, we've learned a lot, and Lewis will be sharing that in a minute. Uh, before we get there, I just wanted to make sure, because I, I never like to assume, uh, but you know, Unreal Engine now is free to develop with. Uh, any, any one of you could download it today and begin to develop using the exact same tools that we at Epic Games use. Uh, there's no difference. Uh, source code is freely available on GitHub, so if you want to modify our engine code and extend it and bend it to your will, you can do that. Usually there's no need because it's an incredibly deep tool set that will do a tremendous amount if you take the time to learn it. Um, so shameless blurb here, tomorrow we will be conducting Introduction to Unreal, which is a four hour tutorial where we're gonna run you through the basics of Unreal Engine, uh, how to get started, where to learn more, and where to go next. Uh, until then, uh, I'm just gonna pass the mic to uh, Louis Cataldi and um, uh, enjoy. Hey everyone, how are you? So just uh, to get an understanding of who's here, how many of you work with Unreal Engine currently? You'd raise your hands. So a couple. Yeah, a little bit. Um, and how many of you work in other game engines? So hopefully a lot of you. How many of you work in tools like Maya or Max or things like that? How about in 3D in general? Photoshop? So one of the things that I think is really interesting uh, is that I'm constantly surprised uh, how much people already know about Unreal Engine. And one of the things that I do is I travel around the world with Andy, and part of what we do is help transfer knowledge. Because you already know a lot about Unreal Engine, and I want to help you to understand what you know about it. And we're going to spend a little bit about uh, time talking about that. <clears throat> but before we do that, uh, we want to talk a little bit about VR. We want to talk a little bit about Epic's journey with VR. And primarily because that seems to be a, an important focus of what um, happens right now around the world and in many conferences. So Epic's been working with uh, virtual reality for quite some time. We've got deep partnerships with companies like Oculus, HTC, and Steam, and those, uh, and pretty much everyone in the field. And um, as such, we've been working inside of Unreal Engine 4 and creating demos. And as Andy mentioned, Unreal Engine is free for everyone to download and use. But one of the things that has really changed about Epic as a company is that as soon as we make things, in many cases, we start to share them. Because Epic is a kind of company that makes things and makes things like the engine makes them freely available for everyone to use, builds interesting experiences in the engine, and then as opposed to kind of traveling around the world with armies of people and then sitting down and showing everyone exactly how we did stuff, we just want to give it to you and let you look at it. So not too long ago, as we started delving deeper and deeper into Unreal, we took some existing content and we started putting it into virtual reality. And one of the earliest demos, and this isn't it, we took a demo we did in Unreal Engine 4, <clears throat> which was kind of an interesting particle effect demo, which had some really cool monsters in it. And we threw everyone in VR into it and had that experience sort of available for people to move through. And it was really interesting, and it worked pretty well, but it wasn't ideal and it wasn't optimal. Uh, primarily because there was a lot to learn about just being in VR space and moving through VR space. Uh, so then we tried a couple of other things until we started really designing for virtual reality. And one of the projects that we did 
gosh, about two years ago now, um, became very interesting because through our partnerships with company like Oculus, we decided to target the uh, development kit two that they had, and we created something called Showdown VR. Have any of you seen or played with Showdown VR? Yeah, so it's a, a, a really interesting experience. It's a fairly passive experience. You are sort of spawn yourself into a battle scene where you're lazily moving down a street uh, where there's all kinds of action going on. And it's very immense, kind of slow-mo, sort, sort of um, matrixy kind of event going on with cars blowing up. And, uh, and at the end, you're greeted by a pretty nasty sort of mechanical monster. Uh, but it was very interesting because we really worked to tune the engine to hit the frame rates on the DK2 and really learn everything we needed to learn to make a very comfortable experience in VR and to understand how to render at the highest level of fidelity in there. And we showed it to a lot of people. We took it to a lot of trade shows. It was very interesting and exciting. And not too long ago, we decided to release it. So for those of you who go home today, which you can, and download the engine, one of the very first things that you do when you download the engine is you download the launcher. And in the launcher, there are a series of tabs, as you can see. You've got a community tab, a learn tab, a marketplace, and a library. And if you go to the learn tab, you'll discover that Showdown VR, the entire project, is completely available to download. And you can download the whole thing. And if you have access to a DK2, you can boot it up and play it right there. Uh, Unreal Engine actually is very simple to use in VR. If you've got something like a DK2 or uh, a Steam VR or whatever the case is, and you plug it in and you run the driver code for it, Unreal Engine will become aware of it instantly and you'll be able to launch experience. Uh, and I'll show you the, where those buttons are. And tomorrow we'll actually work in VR. So uh, it's, there's really nothing you have to do anymore aside from plug your devices in and the engine recognizes them and allows you to launch your experience immediately in VR. Now that doesn't mean it's a good experience and it won't make everyone barf. And we'll talk about that a little bit because uh, developing and designing for VRs is a very important sort of a lesson that I think many of us have a lot of exploration to make in. But what's interesting and I think valuable is you can download this whole experience and sort of explore how we cheated because a lot of working currently in virtual reality, at least at the highest levels of visual fidelity, is about learning how to cheat in order to achieve frame rate. And so this is a great project to download six, seven, eight gigs. And when you do that, you get 161 static meshes, a series of skeletal meshes, 189 materials, 450 textures, effects, and that's not to mention all the audio files and everything. And once you have those, one of the cool things is that all this material you can migrate out and into your project uh, and uh, start using it in your own development. We also built an experience called Couch Nights, uh, which is available for everyone to download as well, where you've got two guys sitting in a room and this is actually a multiplayer experience, and you can download this and work with it as well. And you've got two players sort of with an AR setting, uh, and all the network code in there for doing multiplayer VR is available for everyone to explore and learn. And that's kind of what we do. We put these things up, and we make them available so that you can dissect them and learn. Most recently, we made an experience called Bullet Train that actually uses the touch controllers that Oculus will be shipping at some point. Uh, and we're still sort of sharing that with folks, and it's really quite engaging and very interesting. And a lot of people uh, are really quite interested in it. And it's, and it's quite amazing uh, and fascinating. Anyone seen videos of this? If you get a chance to explore this, this is really quite a stunning demo. It's very matrixy and very exciting to explore. So how do you on-ramp? into working in Unreal Engine and VR. And I'm going to try and move through this pretty quickly because I don't believe there's a whole lot of time. So one of the other things you can get from the Learn tab is something called Content Examples. 
And content examples is probably one of the most valuable ways if you were to go home today and try and learn Unreal Engine. It's sort of like a recipe book, as I like to call it, because within content examples is a series of 43 or 44 maps, one of them being a VR map, that you can look at and open up and pretty much every major feature of Unreal Engine is listed as a small kiosk side by side. So if you wanted to see how to fracture an object and make it a real-time destroyable object, or how to do cloth simulation, or how to do all the types of different particle systems, or all the different types of lights that are available to you in the engine, you can go through content examples and very quickly see how we did it. But there's also, in many of those examples, a little green question mark that if you select it in the details panel on the right side, you have a link to very targeted, well-developed learning resources that'll teach you exactly how to build a lot of these things. So, you know, this is as valuable as having a recipe book so that you can utilize this information in your own project. So I strongly encourage you all to explore this. And if any of you are educators and want to learn Unreal Engine to teach it to your students, this is an invaluable resource. Because virtual reality is such a cutting edge technology, we are constantly developing for it. As a matter of fact, every major release, there's something quite stunning and new. So within the launcher, in the last tab, you'll find right at the very top there, a release notes link. And in many cases, we develop so quickly, Unreal Engine has four major release cycles every year, uh, that a lot of the focused information about the engines goes into the release notes. So if you're doing mobile development, if you're doing VR development, I strongly encourage you all to sort of get used to going to the release notes because in many cases, a lot of the learning resources for the engine go through the release notes into the documentation, right? So we typically document new features, they make it into the release notes, they get cleaned up, improved, and eventually make it into documentation. And we are developing the tool set so quickly that sometimes we release it, sometimes a little faster than we actually put it into the documentation. And it's not because we're jerks, even though sometimes we are jerks. Uh, it's because we've got hundreds of licensees that are working with Unreal Engine, and Epic itself is making games like Paragon and Fortnite and Unreal Tournament, and this development is constantly improving the tool set. So this is an example of some of the material that you'll find in the release notes. But there's a tremendous amount of documentation very specific to VR. There's a getting started, there's index pages. The best practices I strongly encourage everyone to look at. It'll really tell you a lot of the stuff that's later on in this presentation, which somehow I have five minutes and I just got up here, so we'll, we'll see. Um, when they kick me off or drag me off or however it goes. Um, but, you know, if you don't like to read, there's hundreds of hours of videos and we are constantly doing more and more videos and we have a s significant amount of videos just focused to VR development. How to set up controllers on Steam for setting up the Move controllers. Um, tons and tons. As a matter of fact, we do a training stream once a week and it may not always focus on VR, but quite a few of them do tend to be focused on VR. Some of them are focused on AI, some of them are focused on an engineer who's developed a new interesting piece of code. So I strongly encourage you to check out these videos because they tend to be compartmentalized and fairly easy to consume and rich with valuable, valuable learning resources. We also have many folks that go out and do presentations and they put their presentations on the resource section of our website as well as folks that write articles, and uh, there's some links. And I'm sharing all this stuff as linked information because if you follow my name and go to uh, slideshare.com, you can get this presentation and go to these links on your own as a valuable learning resource for later. There's quite a few community members, because there have been people working in VR in UE4 for quite some time, that are actually generating a lot of material that is super valuable. As a matter of fact, Mitch McCaffrey is, is somebody who's created a YouTube channel, and he has, I don't know, at this point, 20 or so very valuable links and videos on YouTube that really break down what's happening inside of almost any game engine 
when you're talking about VR, what almost every single node in the engine is doing that's provided by Oculus or Steam, what it means to do look-based interaction or teleport, uh, simple IK movement. And he's also very active on our forums and providing a lot of content and learning resources there. There are other folks like Carlos who's making games in VR. And a lot of what these guys are into is trying to solve for a comfort level because as you're developing for virtual reality and submitting this stuff to Oculus or Steam, those guys are going to look at these games or these experiences that you're building and they're going to give them a comfort rating. And in many cases, if that comfort rating is not very high, some people are not going to download your experience or your game. So it can become very important at the early stages of design and development to make certain that you are designing for comfort in VR. And why is that? Because one of the biggest issues in working in VR is motion sickness or simulation sickness, right? And what is that caused by? How is that caused? So one of the major theories of motion sickness is your perception of self-motion and how that separates from your vestibular system, the system inside your body that understands motion physically. And when those two don't align, you can actually have quite an uncomfortable feeling. And there are five major causes for motion sickness, simulation sickness. And when you're designing for VR, it can be very important to be aware of these. One of them is non-forward movement, right? When we design games, particularly 3D games, we're very used to strafing side to side, right? Well, you start doing that in VR, and pretty soon, bleh, you start to barf. One of the most important things, in particular, because that's how we move as humans, is to focus on moving forward. We don't typically move sideways as we're doing what we typically do. We occasionally do, but it's not natural for us. Awareness of vection. Vection is when the world around you or large parts of your visual field feel like they're moving uh, in a different sense than you are. It's kind of that feeling you get when you're sitting parked and a car comes up next to you and maybe they start moving and you're moving and you feel like you're rolling backwards, right? When the world is moving around you and you're not sure if you're moving or they're moving. This can occur in virtual reality quite typically when large parts of your world are moving around you and you're not sure if it's you or it's them or what's going on. It's a concept called vection. Uh, acceleration is also a, a very, something that you want to limit in virtual reality design. Um, as a matter of fact, when you accelerate, if you're doing movement-based locomotion, you want to make sure that you don't slowly ease into it, which is a principle we learn in animation all the time. We want to ease in and ease out. Uh, if you're doing locomotion, you want to be very linear about that. Too much camera yaw, right? Turning this way and that can be very disorienting and very upsetting to the stomach. Uh, some of the people that are not used to gaming will barf really quickly if you turn the camera. And one of the worst isn't so much the turning, but the turning back. So in many VR experiences, they will turn the character and then they will find out if there's a, a discrepancy between the head turn and the body turn, they will make sure that the body turns automatically. And one of the other things that's helped is a static reference frame. If you cover one eye, you become very aware of your nose, right? We as humans are used to actually seeing our nose even if we don't pay attention to it all the time. It gives us a sense of forward and a sense of self. So in many cases, you see games now being developed in VR that have a cockpit or a helmet or something that gives you a static reference element that makes it easier for you to look past the thing in front of you. And that can actually give you a little bit more comfort. You can read all about it. There's actually a lot of material. Plenty of people have done videos about it. Uh, and there's conferences, entire conferences about comfort in VR and designing for VR. Some of the early folks uh, on our forums actually started creating templates. And we eventually here, probably for too long, will release our own templates that will control the character. If you go and download the engine right now, you can launch a game and create 
a first-person template. You can create a third-person template. You can create a rolling template, puzzle templates, all kinds of templates to kickstart you into building a game. We eventually, probably within the next iteration or two, will have a full VR template that will address uh, comfort levels so that you can dial in and out certain portions of the, the elements that I mentioned to you before. Mitch McCaffrey actually put one out uh, back in June of 2014, um, which now is a little bit broken because he's working on a whole new set that he's going to release. But there's a link to it on this presentation that you can still download and play with. And as well as uh, Carlos, well, this is still Mitch's stuff, but he's currently has uh, some teleport mechanics that you can actually download and play with. So if you're interested in doing VR development, there's a wealth of information out there available and whole projects you can download and explore and see how things are being done. And tomorrow I'll build some of these live so you can see really that it's not very much of a challenge. And then there's concepts of how to move through VR without instant teleportation, but a nice lazy movement through space that takes into account forward motion uh, and non-yaw interaction. So. What kind of things can we do inside of, of the engine to improve this experience? Well, if you're starting to develop, if you go down tonight and download the engine and decide that you're going to start building a VR game, one of the primary things you have to focus on is maintaining frame rate, right? These are a lot of the primary headsets that are going to be cons available to consumers, and these are the frame rates that they require uh, if you've been working with the DK1 or DK2, you can see 60 frames, 75 frames a second. The retail rift is going to require 90 frames a second. And that's per eye, in essence, because you're rendering the frame twice. So it's going to cap at that frame rate. You can't go above it, but you can certainly go below it. So it's really essential that you uh, understand how to develop without losing frame rate. And it's not ter terribly hard. You can hit frame rate in the engine very easily, uh, but you have to be cautious about the content. Fortunately, the engine has some fantastic tools. We've got profiling tools, uh, which is this talks about very quickly you can launch a profiling tool and see exactly where you're losing frame rate in the engine with something like a GPU profiler. Recently, we implemented something called instant stereo rendering, which instead of rendering one eye and then the second eye, they render at the same time. And it's a little bit of code that goes into each shader uh, that makes it much easier for, I think we're getting 15 to 20% uh, improvement per frame. Something that's really important to note if you're working in the engine is that because we have built a tool set that has been used a lot for 2D conventions, for making experiences on a, a 2D screen, right? whether it's your television or your monitor, there's a lot of things inside of the engine that are built for a cinematic convention, like lens flares right, and motion blur. Those are all cinematic conventions. And they all are fairly costly in many ways. Uh, but they don't really work in, in stereoscopic rendering. So it's really important that you eliminate them because they don't really add to the VR experience. And pretty soon, in a version of the engine, you'll be able to probably, within the M, uh, template, turn them immediately off. But at the moment, you have to actually go into the post-processing filters and reduce all the quality of something like ambient occlusion or lens flares. And many of these things, uh, particularly with screen space, screen space reflections uh, and uh, the way that anti-aliasing works, they can be costly because what they're trying to do is approximate a 2D frame and a cinematic experience, and they're actually taking away from your stereoscopic rendering. So uh, you want to reduce those as much as possible. And the other things that are fairly important is to understand how to light for VR. Dim lights are much more comfortable. Uh, in many cases, Lighting is one of the most expensive things that is non-performant in almost any real-time environment. So you want to cheat your lighting as best possible. Dynamic shadows can be very expensive in almost any environment. So you want to 
uh, you can have a dynamic shadow, but there are trade-offs. So you want to be very cautious about how you're shading. Here's a, a perfect example of something that actually doesn't move. And in some cases, as we build the experiences, we build at Epic. If that thing doesn't move, you don't need to use a real shadow. You can actually put a textured shadow, a blob shadow underneath. So uh, currently, we cheat as much as we can until the hardware generations improve. Effects is another very important thing. Uh, one of the ways that we can generate so much effects in real-time environments is by using uh, camera-facing sprites. And they work very well on a 2D screen, but now when you're stereoscopically rendering and you start to move your head in a way that you can't really do with a 2D monitor, those things start to break apart very quickly. Uh, there are a couple of different kinds of effects in, in a tool like Unreal Engine, and one of them is a mesh-based effect. And a mesh-based effect actually works quite well because it's actually emitting a mesh that has three dimensions. Those are always going to work much better than a sprite, camera-facing sprite. And once again, reflections are something that make things feel real. They, they make them feel like they're in the world. Uh, so there are number of ways to build reflections in the engine. Uh, reflection probes are probably the most effective and efficient ways to build them uh, as opposed to a full screen space reflection, which is done as a post-process. Additionally, the engine now has a merge actor tool because everything that you see in an environment has to be rendered as a draw call, right? So Unreal Engine now has a merge actor tool, so we can take every table in here, select them, push one button and it turns it into one single mesh and takes all the materials and turns it into one material and it takes all the textures and turns it into one texture. Uh, it's still an experimental tool, but it works quite well and it can certainly save you a lot and reduce the, the, the draw calls from the engine. One of the things that's really important to know about Unreal Engine is that, uh, you know, we use Unreal Engine at Epic to make games every day. Uh, we are using it, as I mentioned, on a, a massive game called Paragon right now, which is a massive uh, online multiplayer game. We use it on Fortnite. And by nature of that, we're constantly developing and improving the engine. And one of the real powers of the engine is the framework of the engine, which uh, this is a C++-based engine, which speaks very well to consoles. but that framework is something that you don't have to write, and there's a whole lot of stuff. When you download Unreal Engine, you get an entire suite of tools that, is, that are built for professional game development. And one of the ones that I think that a lot of people don't talk about is the actual framework of the engine. Um, and one of the reasons that I think is so powerful and that I want to talk about it today is because this is something you don't have to build yourself. Um, and let me advance the slide. It's this concept of really the game mode of the engine and, and where data is really stored and, ke and kept. Programmers in the room, do we have programmers here? What's the demographic of the group? Are artists, raise your hand if you're artist or designer. Designers, programmers again. All right, cool. So if you are designing or developing a game or, or you're really thinking about deploying, you know, in many cases, those of you who have done this before, which I know there's, there's quite a bit of development here, you know that you have to generate this information yourself. You have to design it yourself. Unreal Engine comes with a, a very powerful framework that can scale all the way up to a game like Gears of War uh, or all the way down to a mobile game. And the, this is just a quick sort of look at the framework. What you've got, and I'll break it down into detail, is something that is always there and that you can access at any point. It really begins at the game instance, which is a persistent piece of data that is live throughout the existence of the engine as it's launched. Uh, and it's stored with the engine. And it trickles down to the actual game mode, which is level specific, and all these things underneath. So the game mode is a very valuable sort of tool. And what the game mode does is it really defines the rules of the game. It defines who's the character. It defines what's controlling the, 
the character or the pawns? What's the state of the game? Who are the players and what they're doing in the game? And really all the conditions. And it's just the base rule set in many cases. That's level specific. And you can have multiple game modes, by the way. Then you've got the pawn class. Uh, being a C++ engine, this is an engine that inherits from the parent class. So the pawn, in essence, is all the possessible characters in a game. So if I have a vehicle, and I've got a character, and I've got a spaceship, and I've got a drone, these are all possessible pawns. And this is very powerful because in a situation where you've created a game where you've got a character that runs up to a vehicle, and he gets into the vehicle, and now he's driving the vehicle, and then he ejects from the vehicle into a drone. Uh, those are all different types of pawns, and your ability to possess all those pawns is already built into the engine. You don't have to rewrite that as a programmer, uh, and it's actually very easy, easily accessible through the pawn class. You've got the player controller class, and the player controller is basically the, the rule set per pawn, in essence. You can create a series of player controllers and assign them to varying pawns. Maybe you've got a quadruped character, and you've got a bipedal character, and you've got a flying character. Uh, and each one of them can have their own player controller, and they can cross over. A player controller is really the rule set for how the functionality of a character is really utilized. As I mentioned, the game instance is the persistent piece of information. If I am a character running around the world and I'm collecting coins and I transcend to another level and I need to store that information in a place that is not level specific, I need to send it someplace uh, that transcends the game mode of a particular level so I could write that into the game instance. Once again, this is nothing that you need to write. This is something that's already built into the engine. The player state is similar to the player controller, but this can be your health. It can be uh, how much you've collected. It can be your experience points. It can be any series of elements uh, that add value to a particular player. And similar to the game state, how many people have achieved a particular um, reward system or, or whatever is particularly going on in a game. So these things are all really valuable and important to explore and know, and they're all overridable. You see the screen over here to your right is a game mode override in essence. And at any time, those can dynamically be changed or evolved, which is very powerful because you can do the, all that stuff in code or in blueprints. Uh, so, uh, I encourage you all who are developing games and are challenged in any way to sort of write this stuff for yourself to go and look into it because it's an incredibly powerful part of the engine uh, that is not just the cool shaders and the cool materials and whatever, uh, fracturing systems, uh, but a very powerful way to, to work with things. So, one of the, the real benefits of working with the engine is that if you are not a programmer, and, or you don't write C++ code, Unreal Engine has a, an entire built-in visual scripting system called Blueprints, which has actually been amazing. In, internal to Epic, there are a great many developers that use Blueprints, which is a node-based programming language that uh, actually allows a lot of people to prototype inside the engine and build their own feature sets. And actually is not just sort of a a slow lumbering tool set, it actually is quite fast. It's only about eight to 10 times slower than pure C++ code. So it, because when you press compile, it actually compiles to a binary format. And it actually is, is quite efficient and fast. So within Blueprints, you can build all the things that I just showed you within the framework. You can write uh, variables for player controller, all the functionality for a character can be done in Blueprints in essence. Uh, of course, you can do all that stuff in C++ and, as well, and it'll be 8 to 10 times faster. And we've seen examples of games that are 80% blueprint and 20% uh, C++, 100% blueprint, and some games that are 100% C++ code. But it's a very powerful language that you can learn quite a bit from 
once again, go into the content examples as I showed you earlier, uh, which has five complete maps about blueprints, uh, all the way through blueprint communication to building all kinds of interactive elements. Audio in VR is a, is a really powerful element. And uh, actually, this summer, we uh, will be launching a whole brand new VR engine. I'm sorry, audio engine. Um, but it's super easy, right? Uh, you can bring in a, an audio file and take that audio file and drop it directly into the environment as a placed object. You've got all kinds of attributes that you can manipulate that are very powerful. One of the things that's really critical from a VR perspective is a spatializer, right? Which is what localizes something to an environment. If you're working in virtual reality and you move to something, you want to get that localized focus. You want to know where that's coming from. Um, and in some cases, up until recently, that was a manorial signal. But now that's actually become a stereo, stereo spatializers uh, were just introduced into the engine. So you can actually be standing in one place and, and receive the stereo spatialized signal, uh, which is really valuable and really powerful. Um, but the audio tool set is really powerful. And if you get a chance to watch something like Bullet Train, and if you actually go down, download Showdown, you'll actually get that sense of surround audio because there's a lot of focus triggers. And these are some of the things that, that are actually evolving in part because of VR, the ability to use different types of cones and volumes to bounce sounds off walls, kind of like we hear. Audio works for human beings. Uh, we now have occlusion so that you can occlude audio. And when I get down here, standing on this side, even though you've got mics, you know, you would not be able to hear my voice because it would bounce off of this laptop and uh, you wouldn't be able to hear it. You can build multiple sound cues that have a tremendous amount of uh, audio um, properties. We've got a tremendous amount of capabilities within our attenuation ranges so that you've got all this fall off that can be manipulated in different ways. This is, uh, once again, the stereo spatializers, as well as volumes. Uh, and you can work with volumes, reverb volumes, to get all kinds of different reverb. And all these things I, I mention and I point out in here because these are the audio experience in virtual reality can be a significant part of making something particularly interesting or scary, right? Uh, some of the very first games that I think have been really interesting in VR have been s scary games when you're especially focused and walking and all of a sudden the something's coming up behind you and you get that sense of directionality, especially if things are bouncing off metallic surfaces and you're getting that, you know, what the hell is that? I need to get out of here feeling. There is a complete uh, and incredibly powerful set of AI tools inside of the engine that's completely available. Uh, everything from a very basic tool set that just allows characters to move from point to point to a full uh, blackboard system and behavior tree that allows you to do very complex navigation in an environment, and it's quite simple to use. Uh, it's a matter of putting in a navigation volume in place and then just starting to build the logic about why someone would move and what kind of interaction you want to have with them. We have a, a rich set of animation tools, including character retargeting. You can basically bring in one character in his animation and retarget it to a much larger or smaller character. Um, once again, all these things are not different plugins you need to buy for the engine. It all comes built into the tool set. And I bring them up here because if you're starting to get into VR development, it can be a very lonely world unless you bring in some animated characters that are walking around and interacting with you in that environment. And this stuff is not hard or challenging to do if you start to explore animation retargeting and, and some AI tool set. And so really, what's next? Uh, I encourage you all to come tomorrow and, and really see how not overwhelming it is to, to jump in there and build some of your own experiences. Um, what I'm going to do is, is work with content that's freely available to you all uh, and bring it into the engine. And 
build a small experience with some of these principles that I've described using locomotion interaction principles, building some simple blueprints so you can see how blueprint is used in practice. Uh, and we'll uh, slowly go through it and see how it goes. So thank you, Luis and Andy. Thank uh, you for letting us stay.